welcome to our webinar, Mobile or Not, here it comes. My name is Roger Blair, I'm Vice President of Sales with Innovative Learning Group, and I am delighted to be here today with Matt Curtin and Susan Fisher. Matt and Susan will discuss how mobile technology is taking learning and performance work in a whole new direction and the impact that it's going to have on the learning delivery. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about Innovative Learning Group. We are an eight-year-old company located in Royal Oak, uh, Michigan. It's a cool happening spot just north of Detroit. Uh, we're experts in all aspects of training and performance support. We create learning strategies, and curriculum architectures, and we do a lot of uh, design and development. Now, more and more, we're using performance support solutions, and now, of course, we're into mobile. But what we really care about and what differentiates us is our focus on getting business results for our clients. In other words, helping client organizations reach their business goals. Now, as you'll see, we work with a diverse group of medium and large sized companies across the country, and some of these companies we also support on a global basis. So, in short, we can provide and support any learning and performance needs our clients may have. We'd love to talk to you about how we might help your organization should that become uh, a need that you might have. Contact information will appear at the end of this session. Now, just a couple of notes before we start. Um, we want to invite you throughout the webinar today. Feel free to chime in with any questions or comments you may have, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. And because of the number of people attending, we have muted everyone's phones, so we'll ask that you submit questions using the chat in the, uh, in the window. Now that appears at the lower left corner of the screen. If you don't see that chat function in the lower left corner, uh, go to the upper left uh, corner and click on show chat and that will help it to appear at the bottom there for you. Now in addition, we're going to be recording this session and posting it uh, later on YouTube. And following the webinar, you're going to receive an email with a link to a short survey. And we would really greatly appreciate if you would complete that survey. Uh, that's, that's what helps us get better at these each time we do them and, and serve you better. Now, early next week, we will send you links to the YouTube recording and the presentation slides. Now to our presentation. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the presenters. Susan Fisher, Lead Instructional Designer and Learning Consultant. Sue has over 30 years experience designing and developing training and performance support resources for a wide range of business applications. And for the past 15 years, she's concentrated on e-learning. Matt Curtin, lead programmer and learning consultant. Matt has more than 15 years experience developing e-learning courses and learning management systems and has authored more than 200 courses. And now to mobile or not, here it comes. Hello, I'm Susan Fisher, and thank you, Roger, for that great introduction, and thank you to everyone who's attending today. Matt and I are really excited to be talking to you about mobile learning because it's one of our favorite talkers, talkers, <laughs> topics. I was looking at chat, sorry. Um, we're going to address four questions in this webinar today. Um, as you can see, we're going to be talking about what is mobile learning really, where is mobile delivery today, and where is it headed, how mobile is different from traditional learning, and when is mobile the right learning solution. As Roger mentioned, please feel free to ask questions anytime during our presentation by using the chat function. So, let's get started. So we'll start at the beginning, which is, what is mobile learning really? First, it's about content. And the thing to understand from the outset is, that, is this. Mobile learning content is a lot broader than traditional training. It can deliver formal training, but its biggest strength is informal learning. Solutions such as reference, job aids, and other forms performance support. 
It can target learning to the learner's context, that is, to his or her geographic location and or workplace situation. And it can provide for learner interaction and communication with, with the learning material, the workplace environment, the greater learner community, and the organizational knowledge base. So the simplest way to think about mobile learning is that it's the ultimate just-in-time learning. So Sue, let me interrupt you there. What makes a learner mobile? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Matt, because it just so happens I have a slide on that. And in the broadest sense, it can be any learner who's not in a traditional learning setting, such as a classroom, but who instead is working at an on-site job location, like desk, lab, or manufacturing floor, at a job site in the field, um, say a remote company facility or a customer location, or from home or any non-job location, such as a, as a uh, coffee shop or in the car, but of course not while you're driving. Be safe. So here's an interesting statistic along that line, it's forecasted that 75.5% of the U.S. workforce will be mobile some or all of the time by 2013. This statistic comes from a study by the global market intelligence firm IDC. And the study included three categories of workers, office-based, non-office-based, that is people who work in the field, and home-based. In other words, these are workers who can and do take their work with them wherever they may be. Of course, this trend has been developing over the last several years, and most of us are probably among these mobile workers. Sue, here's a question. How can someone who works in an office be considered a mobile worker? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's kind of a, a gray area. Um, obviously, if somebody's sitting, uh, comes in and sits in a queue all day and works on their laptop, they are probably not mobile. But somebody who does work, comes to, to a location to work every day, but maybe is walking around to different offices or different locations within the building during the day, they could be mobile. And they could be, ha could have their device with them. Um, and be using it during the day. So I'd like to stop and do a quick poll. Um, I'm wondering how many of you consider yourselves to be mobile workers. So answer this question by clicking one of the choices and then clicking submit. And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, I see everybody's voting. That's great. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, so I've closed the poll and here are our results. Um, looks like most people, about a little over half of you, think that you're mobile at least once in a while. Uh, the next largest group is often. Um, we've got a few that are all the time and a few that are never. Yeah, interesting, almost the same all the time and never. But, Sue, so you started by telling us that content is one thing that defines mobile learning. Is there anything else that defines it? Well, thanks for getting me back on track, Matt. Uh, yes, the other half of mobile learning, and this is right up your alley, by the way, is the delivery device. That's, of course, what enables workers and learning to be mobile. So we most commonly think of smartphones and tablets, but actually other devices can be used for mobile learning, too, like media players, such as an iPod or MP3 player, cameras and other recording devices, and even more robust computing devices, such as netbooks. And, of course, many companies use dedicated handheld mobile devices uh, for their job, and just think about FedEx or UPS delivery guys who um, use it to scan packages when they pick up or deliver them. But the key to the most robust use of mobile learning is connectivity to the Internet, which can be accomplished through either Wi-Fi or a cellular network. 
And in situations where a connection isn't possible, though, the device should still be able to provide the learning function. Right, Nat? Well, sure. Applications in the data, or I'd say at least some of it should be downloadable whenever possible. So as you might be realizing, um, mobile devices can provide a mix of work and learning functions. And thus, mobile workers can be mobile learners at the same time. So with mobile, the line between work and learning blurs. Learning actually becomes integrated with job performance. And to me, that's the most important thing to remember about mobile learning. Well, could you give us some specific examples? I sure can. Um, I've got a few of them here, and these are actually the ones I'm going to share with you are real workplace examples from real companies who are using mobile today. Um, however, in the interest of full disclosure, we did make up these photos that we have here, so um, just to protect the innocent. So this first example uh, are field service technicians for a company that installs HVAC equipment in large buildings, and they use their mobile devices to do things like order parts and track inventory in their trucks, access schematics and repair procedures from the company database, take photos of problems and send them to experts back at corporate for troubleshooting, and then receive repair guidance back from those experts on their device. And in this next example, a national electronics retailer gives its store associates a mobile device that reads barcodes on the sales floor to display detailed product information. The associates use it to answer customer questions on the spot and to learn more about the product themselves during either structured or unstructured learning time. And in my last example, a pharmaceutical company delivers formal compliance training, corporate documentation, video podcasts, and more to its global sales reps via their smartphones and tablets. Training completion data is sent back to the corporate LMS from their devices. So before we go on to your next poll, I see there's a good question here from Gary. Um, what is the ideal longest duration for mobile learning? two minutes, five minutes, or other. And I think, John, that might be interesting to look at depending on whether you're looking at formal training or you're using it as a performance support tool. And also, in my mind, it would make a difference on whether that mobile device you're taking it on is a phone or a tablet, how much time you could tolerate. What are your thoughts there? Well, I'm not sure I have a, a, a minute number to give you. I mean, definitely we want uh, mobile uh, learning solutions to be short. They should be short and targeted and specific and focused. So I would say, especially with a, if we're talking formal learning, we want no more than maybe, you know, 15 minutes that I would say at tops for a, for a formal training course. If we're talking about more performance support, these will be little, little pieces that they can get to quickly and maybe spend you know, a minute or two to access and, and absorb and read and absorb and, and process. And then another question from Barb, are there any instructional system designer apps that you would recommend for creating content for a mobile workforce? So in that one, I don't know about from the design side, from the authoring tool side, there are certainly some programs that are better suited to someone with less programming experience. So you might look at a tool like Lectora for developing content, or you might even look at something like iBooks Author for creating content to be delivered um, to iOS devices where you don't really have to do any programming, but you could add interactivity in there. Again, I don't know um, from the design side particularly if there's much to add, but certainly there's authoring tools better suited to instructional designers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great answer, Matt. I mean, I think that the the tools that you use for designing are going to be whatever you're, you are in general, whatever you're used to using now for any type of learning, particularly e-learning. Um, the difference really comes in on how you are designing, you know, how are you creating this, this, uh, solution. And, um, 
we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it really depends on the um, the how mobile is consumed and how it's delivered. In other words, you have to be cognizant of how people are taking it, you know, in these short bursts and how it's going to be delivered on, on a small screen. Okay, I have one more question here from Elaine. Can you share those tools again? Uh, the tools that I mentioned were Lectora and also iBooks Author. And um, if still you have follow-up questions about those tools, we'll have more questions at the end, or you can feel free. We'll have our contact information. I'll be glad to send you a more detailed list later. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'd like to do one more poll here, um, and I'd like to ask you if your organization is using mobile learning right now, and if you could take a second to uh, choose one of the choices here and then click Submit. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to answer. Okay, we got a lot of people keep on answering. That's great. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and take a look at the results. So it looks like uh, over half of you are just starting to think about it. Um, the next largest group, we've tried one or two initiatives. That's great to hear. Um, the next group in the planning stage, and a few have implemented it extensively. So it looks like uh, for most of us, um, you know, it's, it's something that's been on the radar recently over the last year or two, and people are really starting to think seriously about it because it's not going away. It's just going to become more and more important. It's really interesting to see where organizations are today. But, Sue, what's the bottom line for mobile learning going forward? Well, Matt, I think we can all agree that today's knowledge workers, which encompasses just about everybody today, by the way, need to understand and apply a whole lot of information. They need to collect, interpret, and report data and solve problems as they arise on the spot using that information and data. So because of that, just in case traditional training will play a smaller role, not going away, but it's going to play a smaller role, while just-in-time informal learning will become more and more important. And to me, that's the exciting promise of mobile, that it enables learning opportunities to be ubiquitous. Learning can happen anywhere and anytime. Now, Matt, tell us a little bit about where mobile delivery is today and where it's headed. So I, I want to take a second to answer another question that's come in. Actually, a couple of people have asked a question about could you use Flash as an authoring tool because iOS devices don't support Flash in the mobile browser. And that's actually one of the most commonly asked questions. Um, it is a fact that you cannot use um, Flash to develop applications that will run in the browser on iPad and iPhone. However, you can use Flash as the authoring tool to develop an app that will run on those devices. And so oftentimes you can gain some synergy by developing one version that runs for Flash in the browser on PC and then runs as an app on those devices from the same source code. Now, um, I want to um, kind of set the stage as we're going to go from the past to the present to the future of mobile devices to get you thinking a little bit. How far back does mobile history go? When did mobile devices really get started? So we've got our picture here from the Stone Ages up to today. Where do you think the history of mobile devices began? I'll give you a few minutes to enter your answer there in the chat box and click send. So I'm seeing the answers start to come in from the early 1970s to the 1980s to 2000. People guessing about 10 years ago. With the invention of the telephone? Some say, yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's right in some ways, about 30 years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at the data that's in xtimeline.com, um, which tracks the history of multimedia. And I'm going to start with um, when the CD became a standard household item, which was in 1990. A few years after that, I was using AuthorWare and Director to develop CD-ROM-based e-learning courses. 
about 1995, I started moving from CD-ROM to web-based training development. And the interesting thing is that the challenges in moving from CD-ROM to web-based are somewhat similar to the challenges for moving from web-based to mobile. For example, in that move from CD-ROM to web-based, there was a 28-8 um, modem speed. And so you had a lot of challenges delivering audio and video and web-based that you didn't have in CD-ROM. And then if we continue in the timeline, if you look at uh, about the year 2000, that's when mobile phones really took off. And uh, it really wasn't smartphones then. The mobile phones weren't smartphones with apps. They were pretty much just phones. And then if you look at the next seven years, between 2000 and 2007, um, digital cameras became cheap, social networking took off, and Web 2.0 was recognized. So if you look at this history, it makes it seem that as though not much happened from the beginning of time through 2000, and everything has happened in the last 12 years. But I did some investigating, and that's not quite the case. Do tell us about that, Matt. Well, when I started looking at the history of mobile, I found some videos from YouTube from around the mid-1990s that showed plans for mobile devices from Apple and Knight Ritter. Now, the videos won't show well through the web conferencing, but if you would go to YouTube and search on the two bullets here, Apple, Apple Tablet Vision or the Tablet Newspaper, you'll be able to easily find these videos, which I just found to be fascinating. For one thing, it's interesting to see um, how far back there was a commitment by technology companies to developing mobile devices before they finally got here in their present form the way we know them today. It's also interesting to see how close they were to being right about what they predicted the mobile devices would be like. For instance, Knight Ritter's vision of the evolution of the tablet newspaper got most things right. There were two key points they missed. When you watch that video, you might kind of laugh because everyone in the video is using styluses. And although those, you know, those are used on some mobile devices today, a lot of times you're just using your finger to swipe around on the mobile device now. And then the bigger spot where they were, were far off from what it would be like is at 1990, there wasn't enough high-speed Internet everywhere for them to envision that newspapers could be delivered over the Internet. So they envisioned that you would receive a cartridge, something like a USB flash drive that had your news for the day on it, and that that would be mailed to you, and you would plug it into your tablet to read the news. Interesting, Matt. So how did today's mobile devices compare to traditional desktop and laptop computers? Well, I want to compare them on these four dimensions. So let's start with computational power. So you could think of this as the ability to crunch numbers or to run more sophisticated programs, or you could also think of it as how long it takes a program to do things once you tell it to do it. So even today for the same price, a desktop computer would be more powerful than a laptop computer, and likewise laptop more powerful than a tablet and a tablet more powerful than a phone. So the desktop would be the winner in computational power. Now, if you look at overall ease of use, I guess not, not as, at a specific task. If you look at a specific task, like some particular application, it's possible that your desktop or laptop might be better because it's better suited to that particular application because it has the keyboard. But if you just look at the general ease of use of the device itself, I think that nowadays you would find that your tablet and your phone are much easier to use than a computer. And what I would use as the evidence for that is over the years, I would say I've spent hundreds of hours helping people figure out how to use Windows computers, but I've got my three-year-old daughter who can't use a laptop yet, but she can use an iPad and an iPhone. She can turn them on, swipe to log in, find the game she wants to play, which, by the way, I've set up as learning games to teach her vocabulary and spelling and things Good like going, that. Good going, <laughs> And so by the time um, she reaches eight years old, which is when I first started using a computer, she will have had hundreds of hours working with the tablet to have an opportunity to learn things. Then um, if we look at mobility, you would, you would think this is a category where mobile devices surely should win. But it's not only how easy can you carry the device to other places, but also, as you indicated earlier, the ability to connect to the Internet once you get the device there because you need to do that. So the phone is going to be the clear winner here because it's the easiest to have with you at all times. But a tablet comes in a close second place, and if you're talking about mobility within the office or mobility within your house, you'd much rather carry a tablet around than a desktop. And I think if you take that comparison, like no matter how good your Internet connection is, when you get there, you're not going to want to carry your desktop around because it's just too heavy to do so. 
And then finally, battery life. If we compare these for battery life, the phone and the tablet are much better. The phone is going to have the longest battery life. And the other thing is, is when it does go into a suspend state and you need to resume with a phone or tablet, you can resume from suspend uh, instantaneously. And that's been one of the things that's been notoriously slow about a laptop. Yeah, I certainly agree that battery life on mobile devices is far better than on my laptop. So, Matt, can you talk some about the platform choices currently available for mobile? Sure. Um, I have collected some statistics from StatCounter for the last year that shows the trends of the platforms. So the trend in the U.S. is definitely towards Apple and Android devices over the course of the last year. You see they're both near the top here, the blue and the red. Um, this gray line in the middle is kind of the BlackBerry trend for the last year, which has been dropping off, and most of the other smaller players are kind of near the bottom, um, with Windows 7 phone moving up just slightly. Um, but there's more to pick than just the operating system, right, Matt? What about the phone or tablet? Well, that, that's a good question. If you choose iOS, then the devices are limited to just what Apple offers, so you just have a few choices there, some different um, sizes of the hard drive, or whether it's Wi-Fi or cellular. But if you choose Android, then there's going to be hundreds of devices to choose from. And this can be kind of a double-edged sword because then you're going to have more flexibility, but you're also going to have more complexity if you're going to try to create a solution that will run across them all. And so uh, we actually have been looking, I think there were some questions about BlackBerry development. Um, and we have been looking into BlackBerry development for a couple of different clients. And um, from what I have found from personal experience, it's not too bad if you can target a few individual devices for the later operating systems. But if you're trying to target older, like the OS 5 or so, um, it's going to mean another platform. If you're going to try to develop an app, you need to use a different approach than you would use on an Apple device or an Android device. And if you would try to create a mobile web app or a mobile website rather than an app, um, you could run into the trouble that you've got all those different screen sizes to develop for, and the support for JavaScript may not be equal. Um, so it can be very challenging trying to reach lots of different platforms. I think that's a, um, probably a good segue into our next topic. Yeah, we want to talk a little bit about the difference between mobile websites um, delivered via the browser and mobile apps. And I think people who have... Uh, Modern smartphones uh, are more familiar with apps than mobile websites. But So what are the differences? So mobile websites are just like regular websites for your laptop, except for they're optimized for mobile devices. So that is for the smaller screen size and the touchscreen user interface. So advantages to mobile websites include that your content is customized to the smaller screen to allow for easier reading and use. There could be lower development costs as compared to app development, and that means particularly when you're trying to reach a lot of different devices, you could use pretty much the same coding to reach multiple devices, perhaps, um, though you might have to make some customizations. Um, there's support for dynamic content. That means content updates can happen in real time instead of waiting for it to be updated. Content is completely cross-platform and cross-device, and so this ties back to the lower development costs. And also, you could um, be able to leverage the existing development and production tools and processes. So if you're de used to developing websites, then developing for mobile websites uses pretty much the same skill set. Now let's take a look at mobile applications or mobile apps. So developing an app allows you to use the full capabilities of a specific mobile device. Advantages are that you don't need an Internet connection all the time to be used. So you've got to be connected to load the app to your phone, but once you've done so, the content is on the phone and doesn't need a connection. You can take advantage of the native user interfaces of the device for fast graphics, video, and content, and you can leverage the app stores like Apple, Amazon, and Google for content distribution. Next, I want to show you an example of a mobile app that we developed for iPhone, iPad, and Android using Thomas Gilbert's behavior engineering model. So if you're not familiar with Gilbert's model, it's used in the performance improvement field to identify the probable causes of performance problems. It consists of six cells describing different factors that support human performance, three found in the workplace and three within individual performers. 
So we turned each of the cells into questions that you can use to access the assess a performance issue. All right, um, I'm going to take us through. I want to uh, let you know that this app is available for free um, at the iTunes um, Store for Apple and um, at the Android Marketplace. So if you search for using Gilbert's Behavior Engineering Model, you'll find it right away, and you can download it for free at the beginning. Um, you just have a splash screen here that describes this tool, and you click Begin Assessment. As you work through um, the questions for each of the six cells, you answer yes or no. <clears throat> Are expectations for performance made clear to employees and is relevant and frequent feedback provided to them? So if you say yes, you get some feedback there. And if you say no, um, you get some feedback and also some possible solutions for how to correct that problem. So you might correct this with communication pieces, orientation programs, an employee handbook or the other items listed here. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to skip through. I'm going to just quickly answer the questions rather than taking the time to focus on all of them. And at the end, then you get a summary where you can look at each of the six cells and then get the feedback for each of those. And if you download the new version um, from the uh, iTunes store or the Amazon Mar Android Marketplace, rather, um, you'll also have the capability to email these to yourself. So that's our app. And the next thing I want to do is kind of get us thinking some about the future. So I'm going to do another poll. And here what I'd like you to do is consider these three scenarios and decide which ones could be met with mobile solutions today. Is it possible with mobile now to repair a dryer without prior knowledge? To send multimedia messages with not only audio or text or video but also smells? And is it possible to view 3D schematics without 3D glasses? So in this case, you're able to select as many as you think are possible. So check all that apply and then click Submit. I see these people are answering a question about um, the app that we developed. How did we develop it? What authoring tool did we use? Um, we developed that actually using Flash. And the good thing about that approach was that in that case, by starting with Flash as the source, we were able to reach both Apple and Android from the same source without having to do hardly any modifications at all. All right, it looks like most people have had a chance to vote. And it looks like we have, oh, an identical split between the first and the third, and not very many people thinking the one about smell. So let's take them one by one. So repair a dryer without prior knowledge. Actually, I know about this one personally because I had to do it one time. Uh, my dryer, the heating element in my dryer stopped working. So I pulled out my handy iPad, um, searched for videos about how to repair your dryer, and I happened to find one that was right for the model that I had. Um, and it was great. It showed me step by step every step I needed to take and safety considerations to be aware of and how to test if the part needed to be replaced. Like, was that the right part to replace before I went to the store? So, yep, tablets helped me with that one. The next one, send a multimedia message with smells. So I think people are mostly right in um, thinking that that can't be done, but actually in searching for things that were on the cutting edge now, I found a video at CNET that showed a mobile phone that where you plug into the phone um, something that's almost like an air freshener that can do like eight different smells, and you can trigger it from the other end by sending a message to start it uh, that smell. So generally, you can't send smells in general, but you can send specific smells for whatever that's worth. And then use 3D schematics without 3D glasses. So there's a couple of devices. I think first we have the Nintendo 3DS and then the Evo 3D phone that allow you to look at 3D image without having to have 3D glasses. And so if you had an app that could get the schematics there, you'd be able to look at those without having to have 3D glasses. Now, if we look about at the importance of mobile in the future, um, one of the things I thought is to say, well, what is Google thinking about the future because they're so well known? So this is a snippet from an interview with Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of Google for about 10 years. When he was asked in an interview where he sees Google in three to five years, one of the things he said was this. We operate with the assumption that people will carry a mobile device with them at all times. And I've heard from other sources as well that as Google is developing new applications now, their current stance is that any new application that they develop must function first and foremost on mobile devices 
and then on traditional computers. Well, Matt, the technology aspect of mobile is fascinating. I'm excited to see what the coming months and years will bring and what it will mean for learning. But speaking of learning, let's switch back to that topic now. So how is mobile learning different from traditional learning? And by traditional, I'm primarily thinking of synchronous instructor-led training, but my comparison also applies more or less to e-learning. So I'm going to look at it by four dimensions. And the first one is content. So traditional learning is great for providing foundational knowledge, you know, explaining underlying concepts and teaching basic skills and processes, where mobile learning is good for presenting discrete procedures like definitions, diagrams, exercises, and so on, and easily digestible chunks, that is, providing information at the point of impact where it's needed. The second dimension that I'm going to look at is knowledge transfer. Um, of course, traditional learning is a cohesive entity um, containing demonstration practice and feedback all combined uh, into one learning period and all parts reinforcing each other. On the other hand, mobile learning probably can't do all of that, um, but it can en enhance formal learning by providing multiple learning opportunities over time. And the research data definitely shows that learning reinforcement extended over time definitely increases retention. The third dimension is interaction and feedback. Um, traditional learning provides well-documented benefits through interaction with the instructor and fellow students. The trade-off benefits in mobile include computation and data capture within the context of the worker's job and instant communication and collaboration with colleagues no matter where they are. And the fourth dimension is availability. Traditional learning is is, of course, away from the job. It's not available on the job. It takes you away from the job so that you should have few or no work-related distractions, unless, of course, the learners have their smartphone with them in class and are multitasking, and I'm sure you're, you've all seen that. But mobile learning, on the other hand, of course, is always available on the job to provide performance support whenever it's needed, so continuous access whenever needed. But what other characteristics are special about mobile learning, Sue? Yes, Matt, there's more. Um, if you love Thomas Gilbert's behavior engineering model like we do, and you, you saw our, our mobile app on that uh, model, um, you know that traditional training generally affects um, only cell for individual workers' knowledge and skills. That is, training courses can provide the worker with the foundational knowledge and possibly skills to do the job. So mobile learning can do that too, although that's not necessarily its strong suit. But the increased scope and just-in-time availability of mobile learning means that it can also impact Cell 1 data and cell one refers to providing clear definition of role, work processes, and performance expectations. For example, let's take a production line supervisor who is responsible for a certain number of widgets per day at a certain maximum rate of defects. At the beginning of the day, she can look up the day's production standards on her mobile device. And during the day, she can access the current rate of defects, allowing her to make corrections uh, to production if necessary. This data may even be pushed to her in the form of an alert. And mobile learning can also impact Cell 2 instruments. And Cell 2 refers to providing workers with the tools, materials, time, and other resources needed to do the job properly. And let's take, for example, nurses and doctors in a hospital who could use their mobile devices to look at a patient's record and update it with physical exam notes and test results, or access reference information to help them interpret patient data for diagnosis or prescribing medication, ordering tests, et cetera. So, so what's the main takeaway? 
So the takeaway here is that mobile learning has the potential to facilitate and improve real job performance to a much greater degree than traditional learning. Well, Sue, can't uh, performance support solutions that are non-mobile also impact cells one and two of the model? Well, they can. Um, and, you know, I think that, that performance support can be in many forms, and it certainly can be on people's laptops at their desks. But I think what makes, what makes the difference, that what distinguishes mobile, is the fact that it can be with, with you wherever your, your job takes you. And it can be, uh, it additionally has the power to add that contextual um, aspect of being able to interact with your environment, which um, we're going to talk about next, actually. So that, what I want to explain about that is this other aspect of mobile learning that's truly unique to mobile, and that's augmentation. Uh, my two favorite mobile learning gurus, Clark Quinn and Gary Whittle, and I'll talk more about their books at the end, um, they posit that mobile learning has the current capability and future potential to meet the needs of 21st century knowledge workers because of this ability. And mobile learning can provide three types of augmentation. First, it can augment formal learning, um, as we've already alluded to. So, for example, after taking orientation training, new workers can receive periodic reinforcement activities like practices or quizzes on their devices that they must complete on the job. And results could be uploaded to the LMS for recording. The second type of augmentation is augmenting reality. And uh, GPS, Global Positioning System, uh, barcodes and camera readable QR codes are technologies used to augment reality. So earlier I mentioned the store associate who scanned a code on a product display to call up information about that product. That's an example of augmenting reality. Another example are field workers who, based on their geographic location, are provided with information about that location on their mobile device, such as a natural gas utility worker who is given information on nearby pipelines. And finally, uh, mobile can augment the brain. So computing devices are great at doing complex calculations and recording, storing, and retrieving data, tasks that humans, that take humans far more time and mental effort to do, and which are more prone to error when we do them. So for example, a sales rep could access a quoting tool on his or her mobile device that calculates the cost of new equipment based on data about the customer's configuration all done in a few seconds while sitting in the customer's office. Don't, they don't have to go back to their office to do this, their own office to do this. They can do it right there with the customer. So you've been talking about the exciting capabilities of mobile devices. And of course, there's more technology advances coming each year, bringing capabilities we can't even imagine yet. But is mobile always the right solution for learning? Well, Matt, uh, no, mobile is not always the right solution. Traditional training, uh, as well as other methods of informal learning, are not going to go away because they're still the right solutions for certain learning needs. Um, here at ILG, we've developed a decision tree to provide a quick and simple way to evaluate a learning need for a mobile solution. These first four questions that I have up here on the screen um, provide a basic filter um, for whether mobile learning, uh, mobile learning solution is a good match to the need. Let me get my highlighter out here. Um, so questions one through three address essentials about the learning need. Is the learning need skill or performance based? Do learners need the learning content on the job as performance support? Um, or does learning, does learning need include follow-up reinforcement of formal training over time? So if you answer no, basically no to, um, to two and to three and from one down, um, 
you'll find that probably formal training is sufficient. So there's probably no need for mobile. So that's the first gate. If you've answered yes to either one and two or two and three or just three, uh, if you follow that logic, it does make sense. You go to the question four, which is, can the learning content be provided in small, discrete, easily digestible chunks? And that's really um, the last point in this initial check, the last gate. If no, if you can't, then other solutions such as job shadowing or coaching or reference manuals may work better. But if you answer yes to four, then we'll continue to the, to the next four questions in our decision tree. So questions five and six assess the learning content further, and question seven assesses the learning need further to see if content and need could benefit from computation uh, features, um, communication, or context augmentation. So if you answer yes to any one of them, you'll come down to um, the last question. But if you answer no to all three, five, six, and seven, a mobile solution may not be optimal. Um, but it could be considered if the answer to question eight is yes. And so going to question eight, are the learners mobile? I mean, that's really the bottom line here. If if they, if you've passed, your learning need has passed all these other gates, final question is, are the learners mobile, either within or outside the workplace? If yes, this need is a perfect match for a mobile solution. If no, if they're not mobile, this need does not call for a mobile solution. You might want to look at other uh, types of informal learning instead. Uh, I love the simplicity of this assessment, but isn't there more to it than that? Well, yes, of course. You should develop an overall mobile learning strategy for your organization, which takes into account a lot of other things, such as mobile device selection and the infrastructure support that's needed. And the ultimate goal is to make mobile just another tool in the organization's learning toolbox, seamless and familiar. But it may be easier to get started down the mobile path by picking just one small learning need and implementing it as mobile. It's a lot less overwhelming, and it will give you some information on what works and what doesn't work within your organization and your workforce and how easy or difficult it is to implement. And, oh, by the way, I want to mention that this decision tree, if you're interested in, in uh, getting it, uh, yourself. It is available on our website and I'll tell you where in a minute when we get, um, when we're talking about our uh, resources for further information. Okay, so we've just touched the surface today really um, of mobile learning. There's so much more to talk about um, and if you want to delve deeper there are a great many resources out there, especially on the web, of course, and their number is growing all the time. But these first two books that I have listed up here are a great place to start, whether you know something or nothing about mobile learning. I highly recommend that you read both of them. Um, I mentioned these guys before, Clark Quinn and uh, Gary Woodall. They're considered mobile learning gurus today. Uh, their books are both highly readable, and they provide a lot of great information, a lot of good examples about how mobile learning can be used um, in the workplace. And if you want to learn a little bit more of them, I did a review, I did a blog on them uh, last September that you can access by going to this uh, address that we have on the slide. And you can also follow ILD's Mobile Learn series as we explore different aspects of mobile learning. There are three installments so far, and we'll be adding several more this year. In fact, we'll put our fourth one out in just about a week from now on options for mobile delivery. Uh, they're available on our website at the address shown at the top here. 
And we also provide many more bonus information resources about M learning there in our mobile line bonus content. And I also want to mention just right there that, that our decision tree is available as bonus content for mobile line number three. Um, and so if you go to that URL, you'll be able to find it. Okay, at this point, we want to um, stop and take any additional questions that you might have. It looks like we may have selected for us in chat. You can continue to enter yours in chat, and uh, I'll take one um, right away. Um, I saw a question about um, what about using podcasts as a way to reach mobile learners. Has that lost its allure? I thought that was an interesting question. And I think that a podcast is still a good way, but it depends upon um, what your learning objectives are. And you might be able to use only a podcast if you just need to do communication of information. But if you need to have the learner practice things, then you might want to think of, of a podcast as a part of your blended solution. Like you may deliver some things that way, but you need to put away for people to practice, perhaps an online test afterwards or some other approach. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, you know, pod, podcasts that are recorded that people can listen to, especially audio podcasts, not video, but that they can listen to in their car while commuting is a great way for, um, you know, sending out awareness kinds of knowledge. Or if you live in a big city and you're commuting on the train or the bus, you can uh, watch <laughs> yes. videos on your tablet. <laughs> Absolutely. What other questions do we have coming in? Any others that you see? Um, a question here from Pamela. Are organizations doing about corporate security over the cell phone and Internet? So on mobile devices, you could do a regular VPN connection like you could do for many computers. So you would have equal security for the information being transmitted um, across. Um, but there are some other things that you need to consider with mobile devices that may or may not be as big a concern with traditional computers. Um, one of them is that, you know, if your device gets lost and somebody else gets it, how many places have people put in their password so that it doesn't need to be re-entered so somebody could get right back in. I suppose the same thing is partly true with laptop computers as well. Um, there are also differences because the um, devices um, now are coming from different manufacturers instead of in many corporate organizations. It would have been all Windows before, so there's some additional considerations because of the variety of devices. And then I think the other thing that's interesting here is because it's kind of early in the game and organizations aren't all providing mobile devices as standard to all their employees, you have a mix of people, like if you're going to develop stuff earlier before those devices become standard for the organization and employees are using their own mobile devices to get the things, you may have a much broader mix. So instead of trying to support one standard, you may be supporting lots of different which would be a challenge for security and also for your development of mobile learning and mobile performance support. How about that question from Gina? Can a mobile app work with an LMS? So um, that actually is a um, very interesting question because what we see is that um, while the SCORM standards and AICC standards that have been in place for years for traditional learning are great for web-based training, um, because um, you're working from mobile devices in apps at points, it doesn't make sense to use that standard as much or it can be harder to use the device. And so what we're seeing a lot of is um, LMS vendors are either adding on to their system or new LMS vendors aimed specifically at mobile are popping up. And what they really want to sell you is not only the system for tracking, but also the capability to author as well. So you can't just really say, okay, I want to take my existing courses and load them to mobile and start tracking. Instead, you may need to look at buying this new LMS that supports that or buying a second LMS that supports that and then route scores and things, bookmarks back to your LMS after it collects them there. Here's a question from Pamela. Are companies buying the hardware for their employees? I think we've seen a mix on that, Matt. I would say it's a mix. We um, have clients who have purchased a large number of devices for all their employees, but I think for most we're seeing it's earlier in the game and they're still trying to decide. Um, we do have some, some batches that have large numbers of older devices that aren't so good at this and they're looking to when can they move to the newer devices, but not a large number who are on current up-to-date devices. 
We got a question. I don't know if we got to that. Any HTML5 authoring tools you would recommend? So HTML5 is um, kind of intended to be the way to reach devices, both mobile and traditional, in the future without having to go to a tool like Flash Player to get it to all those devices. So HTML5 is a continuing to develop standard, and so it's not really in place and uh, not a lot of authoring tools there that are great at HTML5. Now, there are tools that will let you start um, in HTML and add some additional features. And there's a tool that own gap that will let you take whatever you've developed in HTML and convert it into an app that can be loaded on lots of different platforms. Um, but what I think you'll find is that HTML5 is becoming more and more powerful as it gets more support. Um, at this point, it lacks many of the features that you could get even in much earlier versions of Flash. So if you want to do something that's not too complicated, HTML5. Um, is a way to go now. If you want to do something that's much more complicated, you may need to look at development of a native app using something like Objective-C for the Apple devices or Java for the other devices. All right. I think um, I'm going to turn it back to you, Roger, to wrap us up. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're uh, exhausted the questions, and we want to thank you, Matt and Sue, for uh, presenting all this great information today. Um, Wow, there's a lot, a lot to think about when you're when thinking about mobile. And we certainly want to thank all the participants who have joined us today. Uh, again, our contact information is on the screen, and we invite you to contact us with any thoughts or questions or any further comments. Also, we have a Friends of ILG group on LinkedIn that we would invite you to join uh, and join in on some of the discussions that appeared on that uh, on that group. Again, we're going, we will send out the slides and the YouTube link next week to the participants. And uh, don't forget, please, to, to complete the survey that you, you're going to receive. Your, your feedback really is important to us. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.